Hello, everyone. Let's take a good posture. Let's have our best, most present moment of the day. Maybe not best, you can have best moments ongoingly, but most present. Let's bring it home. Take a good posture. Take a good breath. And with respect and friendliness, let's bow to one another all over the world, whether we know each other or not. So I titled today's um, free lecture. This is part of our Nano Remo uh, month of free lectures. And there will be, I think, two more lectures that will be only for folks who have signed up for the book course. Uh, Molly, I'm not seeing the uh, green button. Um, but the book course is at elephantjournal.com slash indie book. And I think we're offering a discount for anyone who does these free discussions and signs up. So I titled this how to edit your book the right way and how not to edit the book the wrong way. Um, what I mean by that, and I want to get right on that is a lot of people don't edit from a good place. Can you raise your hand if you're ever editing to try to like protect yourself, not embarrass yourself, kind of cover up embarrassing anything, try to impress people. If you're trying to edit to make it perfect or if you're trying to edit to make it um, better, um, the whole phrase like live our best lives, I have a lot of issues with that. That I think translates a lot into the mentality of how most folks edit. That's editing the wrong way. We're not trying to make what we wrote better. We're not trying to make what we wrote more impressive. We're not trying to make what we wrote more perfect. We're not trying to get rid of anything embarrassing or vulnerable. Um, anyone else ever fall into that? And sure, the editing that we do, we want the, um, the work, our craft, our writing to be better on some very basic way. Like when you're cleaning in the kitchen, you want it to look better. When you're doing your dishes, you want your sink dish situation to be better. But you're not trying to um, do it out of hating your kitchen or hating your dishes or hating yourself. So I'm not trying to be too touchy-feely, but I don't really have a problem being touchy-feely. Uh, in Shambhala Buddhism, we're all about vulnerability, bravery, because they lead to kindness. They lead to caring about others. So what if we were to edit from a point of view of liking ourselves, um, not because we say we like ourselves, but because we've actually done the work, the path of Maitri, which is another course we have, the Maitri course. Maitri, M-A-I-T-R-I, is the Buddhist notion or practice rather of making friends with ourselves, the parts of ourselves that we like. You would think that's easy to make friends with, but we actually use them. We overexploit them. It's sort of like if someone has big guns, they're always going to walk around in a tank top. We have this sort of unhealthy relationship to the things we like about ourselves. You can say the same for cleavage or, or a six pack or whatever. Um, now, it's great to feel good about ourselves. There's nothing wrong with that. But if we're kind of overusing that to overcompensate for the things we dislike ourselves. So I'm getting into all this psychology because editing really does come from a, an ethic, a point of view, a mission. So editing that's going to be best in the sense that readers will connect with it. They will love it. Their open hearts will connect with your whatever you're writing, and they could be any, it could be nonfiction, it could be biography, it could be poetry. The best kind of editing is going to be editing that is willing to leave the vulnerability or the openness or the genuineness or the truth. Exactly. I love Salima's point. I edit for a living. I find it much easier to edit for others than for myself. What if you could be that relaxed and that judicious we all say judging is bad. The enemy is not judging. The enemy is prejudging, prejudice, preconceptions. 
So what if you lost your preconceptions? I talk a lot about not titling your work until you're done. You can have a working title, but what if you were able, what if you were willing to let go, you prepare, you have structures, you have, um, you study, you do everything you need to do, but then you just let it roll and you see where it goes. If you are editing too tightly, um, you're going to cut off the blood flow of the organic nature of what you're writing, how to connect. It's like giving a speech at a wedding or at an event. You want to know what you want to say, and, but then when you go up there, you just kind of got to let it go and be present, make eye contact with people. Making eye contact with people is the most powerful way to write. Um, you know what you have to say and you connect. All right, so let's go through our agenda. The Buddha said not too tight, but he also said not too loose. That was his advice to a musician who was trying to tune uh, his guitar. So being too loose would mean you don't prepare, you don't know what you're doing, you just sit down, you kind of see where it's going. Well, I got news for you, it might go somewhere nicely, but it's probably just gonna go around like the um, footprints of a pigeon in the snow. <laughs> And no one's going to want to read that because it's going to feel like the discursive wanderings of our friend, the pigeon in the snow. So it is Nano Remo. Anyone know what Nano Remo is? Can anyone type it? Um, a lot of us are working on our books, whether they're fiction, nonfiction. So we're doing, we already have a book course, how to write, publish, and sell the hell out of a book, how to make 90% of the money from your book instead of 10%. And that is what uh, we're offering um, in the green button below, 10% off that. So let's go through the agenda. Uh, not too tight, not too loose. This is the not too loose part. We have an agenda. So, um, number one, I would love to encourage, again, everyone to let go of your favorite title of your would-be one day famously great book to be. Um, those are actually not my words. I think Molly wrote that. I love that. That's perfect. We all have this title. Anyone ever have titles in your mind um, of this great book? And it's going to be so amazing. Um, F. Scott Fitzgerald, as Molly or Emily prepared these notes, um, had, guess how many titles he had for The Great Gatsby? Most of which were awful titles, objectively awful. And I've read the book several times and I love F. Scott Fitzgerald. So I have a feeling for what would kind of put the ribbon on the present, the bow on the present. That's how I view a good title. You have your working title, which in my case, the, the book I'm working on is sort of Buddhism for idiots like me. So Buddhism for Idiots Like Me is my working title, but I'm not attached to it. And at the end, when I'm done with the book, I can say, is that the title I want? Does that really connect? Um, I'm not having any problems. Anyone else having connection problems? Sometimes you just need to uh, refresh. Anyone else having issues? Okay, so Great Gatsby. Other working titles were Gatsby. No one guessed here. Someone's got to guess. Gatsby, how many? Among Ash Heaps and Millionaires, Trimalchio, Trimalchio in West Egg, On the Road to West Egg, Under the Red, White and Blue, Gold Hatted Gatsby, or finally The High Bouncing Lover. So he had nine titles. And then when he finished it, he, maybe his wonderful, revered editor, decided on The Great Gatsby. And something about that title encompasses exactly what that book is about. That kind of looking up at this guy on a, on a pedestal, saying, wow, he's so amazing. And then once you, you get to know him, you realize he's a total wreck. And that's sort of what we do. I call it, the Buddhism calls it theism. And it's not so much about God, it's about our tendency to push people up on high and then tear them down. 
uh, which is also related to our own kind of um, wanting to live our best life and then and then failing. So we could put my non-theism blog in the sidebar. We could put um, four uh, or five ways I wrote to get out of everyday depression because we cr we we create everyday depression in ourselves when we try through willpower, through dreaming to be perfect, to be our best selves. And then we can never measure up to that because that's a fake standard. It's like telling a little girl she has to be like Barbie. It's not healthy, right? Or a little boy. Okay, is anyone feeling this or is this a quiet Thursday group? How am I doing? Am I hitting it? Are you bored? Should I get more into editing? I will get more into editing. Salim is engaged. Thank you. All right, Linda. Okay. So my suggestion, which isn't just about the title, but it's about not torturing yourself, not causing sort of depression. You start writing. It's really good, hopefully. Then you keep writing, second chapter, and then suddenly you you don't quite know what you're saying. Some of it's good, some of it's bad. That's when you need to edit, right? Wrong. You don't need to get into that situation in the first place. If you have preparation, if you have structure, and if you allow it then to organically unfold while keeping your reader in mind. I do, Paige, encourage you to create a dumb, easy, stupid working title. Clunky working titles are awesome because what is your book about? My book is about growing up and going on this 30 mile hike and what I learned. So your title could be growing up and going on a 30 mile hike and what I learned. That's fine. When you get to the end, you'll have your ladybug moment. And that's what I call like a detail in one of the chapters or something you write. You know, all those movies where someone says the title at one point, you'll have a moment that can encapsulate the book. Or you'll think of an entirely new title that encapsulates the book and connects it to our readers, your readers. So Harper, a little bit more. Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird was originally titled Atticus. Um, after she had the working title of Go Set a Watchman, which is actually kind of a cool sounding title. Um, so don't put too much pressure on it to be perfect. Have a working title. Do prepare, have structure, all that. Then let go of it. Like Oprah Winfrey says, the way she does her interviews, and I think she's one of the best, is she prepares, prepares, prepares to take notes, take notes, take notes. How many of you would take those notes out with you to do the interview? Anyone? How many times do you see someone reading a speech from notes? Teleprompter. How many times do you see someone reading from these little note cards or referring to them? You don't do that. You have to prepare enough that is in your bloodstream that you can then afford to make eye contact with your readers. So it's not that you're performing, it's not that you're losing yourself in your readers. Eye contact simply means you have digested everything and then boom. And yeah, you can have a couple notes, you don't have to be too uptight about it. If there's some stats, if you need to link to something, blah, blah, blah. Crystal, that's fine, but it's not about memory. Crystal, I could ask you 100 questions about yourself and you would know that stuff, not because you have a great memory necessarily, but because you've digested it, because it's part of who you are. And when you have digested your preparation and then you connect through writing or making a speech, readers can feel that you're present with them. The worst thing that happens in a book, happens in movies too, is when something happens but there's been no explanation. You ever read anything where there's not an explanation, there's not context, someone's not introduced, they don't describe, 
what someone is wearing or the room they're in, right? Like, you know, all of you have been subconsciously like, okay, hair, face, little beard, red, weird little collar, plants, sunshine, slanty, ladder. That's what we do when we write, right? You're describing the environment. And I'm not just talking about novels. You're describing what you're describing so that the reader can see it and feel it and know where they're at, right? And if you don't do that, the reader is like, I don't really know what's happening. I, I started watching one of those crappy Netflix movies that drive me insane. They're all those like cheap holiday movies and I love the holidays. I feel like they're saccharine and they're cliche. And the movie just started without any introduction, the characters are running around and you don't know who's what or where's who or anything. It was like they forgot to contextualize it for and introduce people for the viewer. And I know a lot of people love those saccharine movies. I love the holidays. I feel like they're a disservice to it. Genuine emotion is like, is like um, a good holiday movie. Like uh, It's a Wonderful Life or Miracle on, what is it, 14th Street? 34th Street, um, you know, it could be an action movie like uh, uh, Bruce uh, Willis and whatever it's called, Die Hard. Um, but you feel it. There's humor. There's there's pathos. There's connection. You got to feel it. And part of that is being willing to describe everything. And part of that is again that eye contact. So yeah, if you want to get away from over editing, prepare more, write more fluidly in the moment, and you need to know basically your structure. You need to kind of know, it's sort of like if you're jogging a 10K, anyone ever run a 10K or a marathon or whatever? You kind of want to know your time per mile. You kind of want to have it paced out. You kind of want to know where you're going, but you don't want it overly cons um, constricted, overly regimented. So, one of my encouragements, anyone ever go through writer's block? I have a video on writer's block. I talk more about writer's block in the, um, in the uh, course. So writer's block is your friend. If you take anything away from today, I hope it's to start listening to your writer's block. Whenever writer's block arises, it means you're doing something, you're going in the wrong direction, right? The most common question is, how do I get through writer's block? How do I conquer writer's block? How do I defeat writer's block? That's, you're being a jerk when, if you're asking that question, you need to listen to writer's block. Writer's block is like this annoying little kid in your, or dog, my dog's right over here, who's in the doorway, you know, and you wouldn't just ignore or try to conquer a little kid or a little dog, you would be like, What's up? Do you need anything? Do you need a glass of water? Do you need some, in my dog's case, some dog food? Um, don't feed the dog food to the kid. Uh, so, you know, what is the writer's block saying? Often it's saying you are getting lost. You are being fake. You are not writing something genuinely. You're trying to pretend you're doing this sort of weird, aggressive thing. Jack Kerouac, one of my favorite writers, had to actually take drugs to get through his writer's block. That's one way to do it. I don't highly recommend it. So I do a lot more on writer's block. I don't wanna get lost in that. Um, but writer's block is a message from your being saying this isn't right. It's kind of like if you're dancing and you're feeling it, you could dance all night. But then if you're, I have a real problem dancing to a song that I don't like. So if a song comes on at a wedding or whatever that I dislike, I'm I'm very comfortable not leaving the dance floor. Like I'm gone. If a dance a song comes on that I love, I'll run. I get excited. I run to the dance floor. So you got to kind of feel it. And if you're not feeling it, welcome to writer's block. It's like dancing to music that you don't really like. All right, and I am going to get to. I want to encourage everyone again to ask a question. I will get to those. I might jump into those early. Exactly, Deborah. Love that. 
Sometimes it's a message from your psyche. If you're over on Facebook and YouTube, we have audiences there too. You can come over to Crowdcast. We have the link there, I think, and um, you can see all the comments here. I can't see the comments in Facebook. So uh, Emily, Molly, if you see any of those comments, um, you can copy paste them over. Jack Kerouac's my, one of my idols in terms of writing. I want to name one of my kids Kerouac. Carrie for short. I think it's pretty cool. All right. All right. Where are we? So one of my recommendations, I did it. I wrote a book called Eco Boy versus Yoga Girl. This was like 10 years ago. This is before Yoga Girl, who's actually a friend of mine on Instagram. This was making fun of kind of this culture that I had been in of yoga, you know, and trying to be environmental, kind of earnest people. And I was just making fun of that. And it was a book I didn't really care about that much. But it allowed me to write every day, have fun, and kind of get practice. Uh, does anyone here want to run a marathon tomorrow without any training? Anyone want to run a marathon tomorrow without any training? Looking for some replies. DMAX says no. Renee says no thanks. Jessica says LOL never. Ember says nope. Vendora says no. Jan says no thank you. So Lori says nope. So if you wouldn't run a marathon without any training, why would you think you can write a book without writing every single day? Writing is a craft. You are going to become better by writing writing every day. That's my point, Paige. So it's a craft. So you want to start, I highly recommend, if there's a book or a work you want to uh, create, you um, you want to work on, first write some, first write every day. Blog on Elephant, write on Instagram, blog on Facebook, um, I highly encourage people not to just feed your stuff to Zuckerberg Empire. Write on Elephant, write on some indie blog uh, that can reach millions of readers and get you out there. Practice, practice, practice. Take Elephant Academy, we can put the link for that in. Do the book course, but write every day, it's a craft. Does that make sense? So when I wrote my book, Things I Would Like to Do With You, I had been writing maybe one, zero to five articles every single day for years. I was in tip top shape. It's kind of like basketball. I have a basketball hoop in my backyard. I'm, I'm trying free throws all the time and they're kind of fun. You know, I'm, I'm jump shots and layups and everything, but just the practice of the free throw, the simple form of your shot is is a practice that I could practice for the, I will practice for the rest of my life. And it's the foundation of everything I do. So if you're not writing, write elephantjournal.com slash post. Uh, no, if you're not seeing a DMAC, just refresh, although you probably can't hear me if you're asking. We have a, Salima, we also have a um, elephantjournal.com slash post. Please write that in there. Um, and we also, Salima, if anyone's weak on the social media part, we go through that in the book course, which we've discounted for your Nano Remo or for anyone here. Um, but we also have an entire course just on Instagram, which right now is pretty, pretty effective. I'm going to close the uh, door. One of my greatest pet peeves is um, leaf blowers. I hate them. All right. Let's see. They actually say that um, your mental health has some relationship to the amount of noise in your life. So if there's ongoing traffic noise or others, you know, you need to find a way to uh, counterbalance that. Go for hikes, meditate, have a little fountain, whatever it is. All right. 
So our entire course about social media, Salima, is exactly that. It's literally, I think, titled Social Media for People Who Hate Social Media. Social media is evil, it's awful, it takes over our life, blah, 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 right? But social media can also be used mindfully. It can also be used to build community, and that community will support you if you're doing it genuinely, consistently, all the things we teach. So yeah, you can hate social media and that can make you perfect for our course. And that's not selling, that's just literally what we do. We have built 12 million Facebook fans. That's a lot, MSNBC I think is two and a half million um, with a corporate budget, which we've never needed or had. Uh, we have nearly a million on five accounts on Instagram. We have, you know, number, number one for environmental coverage twice on Twitter nationally. None of that's bragging. That's to say that we do it because we try to connect genuinely, like I'm hopefully trying to do right now, or hopefully doing right now. Okay, so write that book you don't care about. Ideally, this isn't a book that you even wanna publish. If you wanna publish it at the end, cool, but this is meant to be something no pressure. So write your Eco Boy versus Yoga Girl. Write your, and if you don't wanna write some fake book that you don't care about that much, blog every day, write every day, every day. And you know, it can go in the drawer, the drawer of your desk. Sorry about the noise. It can go in the drawer of your desk. Um, I've been watching Ken Burns, so I wanted you to actually hear the noise of the drawer. It can go in the drawer of your desk. You don't have to share it with anyone, but I don't actually really recommend that ultimately for your craft. It's good to write for the drawer in your desk, for yourself, to journal, to find your voice. That can be very helpful. Are people listening still? I, I love the comments. I'm just, I don't want to be overwhelming or scattered for you. Um, it's good to write for yourself, to journal, to put stuff in your desk drawer and not share it online in terms of finding your voice. That can help find your voice. But after that, part of your voice is connecting with others. So that eye contact notion. So you use that project, the project you don't care about that much, to sharpen your skills and your craft. Writing is a craft. Writing is not um, something that you can just sit down and do, like running a marathon tomorrow with no training. But writing, I mean, writing a marathon, I like that. Running a marathon is actually pretty easy. Who is running a marathon easy for? Who is running a marathon easy for? People who run every day. That's it. If you want, um, so the other uh, virtue of writing on Elephant is we have a team of editors who will work for free for you if they like your stuff. Yeah, people who train, exactly. Um, let's talk about serialization. Serialization isn't really about editing, but it is, um, kind of about editing. So if you wanna connect with readers, have that eye contact, you write succinct chapters and you share it with your readers before you publish, right? Why do you share it before you publish? Because it keeps you in touch with how people are feeling about your work. And you can discount if people say your writing sucks, you can ignore it. Uh, you can feel it, but you can ignore it. If people, but typically people will say in a smaller personal community, they'll have constructive feedback. And if they're just saying stuff like, wonderful, 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 say, what do you like? What do you dislike? What would you like to see more of? It's not that you're going to do change for them, but it's good to get specific feedback, right? I feel like I'm missing uh, comments. Hey, Dr. Eden. Okay, so um, I, I talk a lot more about serialization in the course. Serialization is the easiest way to stay present with your audience and build an audience and pre-sell your book or your work and um, kind of develop a community 
but it also has the virtue of keeping you intimately in touch with our readers understanding this or not. Am I in the right course? I visualize writing a book as wandering blindfolded um, down a long hallway with lots of doors on the left and right and maybe a couple halt turns. So you're walking along, you kind of know who you are, you kind of, you want to connect, but you got to, to connect with the audience, serialization helps. It allows you to peek out from the blindfold. To connect with the audience, um, preparation helps, obviously, looking at the kind of schematics of where you're walking. Um, so I talk a lot about um, more about serialization. That's one of the keys to selling the hell out of your book. Um, and you know, serialization, if you, does everyone here know what serialization is? It's publishing chapter by chapter um, or poem by poem, whatever you're writing, and then sharing that immediately for free with your readers, whether on Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever, wherever your audience is, Elephant Journal, uh, Medium, whatever like Dickens did. Dickens one of the most famous examples of serialization, um, but many, many authors did it. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, misspelled, um, of Sherlock Holmes, Charles Dickens, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Alexander McCall Smith, Stephen King, Agatha Christie, Truman Capote. I recently Googled like famous authors who serialize their books. And I expected, because I wanted to share like a short list um, of folks with you guys. And um, the list on Wikipedia was like 400 names. So this is incredibly common. And you're giving it away for free in the sense of like the freemium model on YouTube. You're, you're getting feedback, but you're getting a service back, which is them reading it. And then you put it all together. And people who read those individual chapters, they're not going to want to dig through you know, 24 different Instagram posts over six months mixed with photos of you, you know, shopping and traveling and or whatever you're doing, they're going to want them all together in a book. They are going to be the supporters. Uh, yes, everyone gets one of these hats. Um, it, everyone gets this exact hat, actually. It's sort of sweat stained. It's crumpled up um, with the book course, guaranteed. All right. Why is it okay to give away parts of the book before it's published? I just went through that. Um, you're getting a service back and people will still want the collection. And this is what I did with things. And I've sold more than 20,000 copies, around 22,000 copies um, at 35 to $45. Sometimes they're discounted a little bit. And um, I get 90% of that money, not 10% because I, I publish independently. And so the book course talks you through how to publish independently, eco, how to print, how to distribute, how to sell, how to build up that audience without ruining your life because everyone hates social media. Everyone who I like hates social media. Some people who I can't stand love social media. Oh, take a photo of me. Oh, I'm going to video myself doing this thing. Um, all right. Okay. So now it's question time. Uh, if you have a question, Go to ask a question. If you don't have a question, go to ask a question and vote up the uh, questions you want. If you want the full book course plus the two other lectures we're going to talk about publishing, selling the hell out of your book, um, do the book course. You'll get the two other lectures this month for free. And, uh, you know, writing a book can be fun. Writing a book doesn't have to be torture. Editing is torture. I'll talk for one minute specifically about editing. I haven't done that much here. There's two kinds of editing that I love and that I did. Edit, live editing, which is sort of like a jazz musician with his or her lips and, and lungs and, and fingers shaping the sound of the music as it comes out. Live editing. I talk about that much more in the book course. Then there's conventional editing, editing after the fact. That's also powerful, but it's highly dangerous because it can lead to kind of that bad editing I talked about at the very top of this video which is trying to make everything look impressive, trying to get rid of anything embarrassing. Has anyone read my book here? Anyone re read my book here? Things I would like to do with you? There's a lot of embarrassing stuff in it. It's super vulnerable. 
it's super embarrassing. I think one of the top, I think I have something like five stars or four and a half stars or something on one of those book websites. But one of the top negative reviews is, I thought I would like this book and I read it and it's so embarrassing and awful and cringy and um, that's what you're gonna get, you know? It's, um, it's it, you know, it depends if you're writing a biography or what, but it's uh, whatever you're writing, you're putting yourself out there. It's sort of, again, with the dancing analogy, it's like John Travolta and What's Her Face in Saturday Night Fever, which if you haven't seen, is actually a kind of a profound and wonderful and dark movie. Um, but uh, you're dancing in public. You know, people are going to evaluate you. People are going to pick you apart. Uh, my book is at elephantjournal.com slash books. And we have a two for not one, but a two for discount offer. If you want to get it for the holidays, it's a great gift. Um, it's very red and gold and romantic and hopefully genuine. Um, but no pressure. And what I just did is how I kind of teach marketing. You communicate the thing sort of shamelessly, but you don't, I don't really care if you buy my book or not in the sense that it's none of my business. It's up to you. So that is my approach to marketing and it works is to be genuine and to shamelessly talk about the thing because you feel good about it. Hopefully you feel good about your work. You feel like it's helpful. It's genuinely intended. Yeah. We ship all over the world, although shipping costs are not up to us. So if it's too expensive to ship to Europe, um, I recommend the ebook or the audio book. The audio book, I put a ton of love into. Um, I may not be the best reader in the world, but I kind of love reading. So might be good. Um, so that's my advice with marketing is don't be desperate. Don't have exclamation marks. Marketing is, is sort of like being vegan and talking about being vegan. I'm vegan. If you're not vegan and you ask me a question, why should I be vegan? I'm going to sort of not answer the premise. It's none of my business if you should be vegan. I don't really care if you're vegan, not because I don't care about animals or I care about veganism. And yeah, if I had that power, I wish you would be vegan, but it's up to you. It's your choice. So I just want to touch on that marketing moment. It's up to you. So I'm going to treat you with respect. I'm going to say, well, if you want to be vegan or I, I would not put pressure on yourself, first of all. So I'm kind of undercutting the premise. I would try to be vegan deliberately once a week. Cook a vegan meal that's delicious, that you love. If there's a couple of simple things like butter, Yoko's is amazing, ice cream, there's tons of good coconut. Coconut's usually my favorite. Ice creams, try to find things you love and try to make a couple meals that are vegan. Explore it, maybe watch some videos, watch some documentaries but don't try to do it today. Don't try to do it tomorrow. So that's my approach to selling a book, to any kind of marketing is, it's up to you. Have respect for people. Don't view them as customers. I don't view any of you as customers or, um, you know, like I want you to click that green button and do the book course if it's gonna be good for your book and your life. If it's not gonna be good for you and your life, don't do it. I don't want you to waste money. I want you to be rich. I want you to be happy. Um, our Maitri course, same thing. You know, we create stuff at Elephant that hopefully is good for people. We don't really care. There's some articles on Elephant, if you read Elephant, that I despise because that, you know, people love to read them, people love to share them, people love to click on them but I don't feel like they're that good for people. But 99% of our articles, I feel like are really good for people. And the reason I allow that 1% is I'm wrong. I'm not God. You know, there's a lot of subjects that people enjoy and they can be gateways for people into the mindful life. So anyway, back to the, uh, back to your questions. Hopefully um, I spent some time. You've all been able to upvote stuff. It's not an order for once. That's weird. Uh, please everyone go to the ask a question button and upvote the ones that you want answered, because I'm probably only going to be able to answer um, four questions. So please take a moment and go to um, the ask a question. 
And yeah, if you do feel like Elephant is amazing, I'll, I'll give a plug that you can also, can we put the gift subscription uh, link in? You can also buy a gift subscription for people. It's only $3 a month. You can buy one for yourself. You're a people. Um, and literally, if we have 30 to 40, 45 subscriptions a day, then I can pay everyone we stay in business. If I don't, we kind of can't. So a lot of the last week, month or two with the election, for whatever reason, we've been down to 10, 20 subscriptions a day. So, well, the gift subs oh, is that the link? Cool. So, and subscribe, it's just elephantjournal.com slash subscribe. So please buy a subscription. Is anyone willing to buy a subscription? Is anyone already subscribed? Say me if you already subscribed. Say me, me, me if you're willing to buy a subscription. All right, back to your questions. Everyone's upvoted chastity. How would you go about finding someone to edit when just starting out? So first of all, I highly recommend live editing. I talk about that more in the course. You are the best judge of you. Um, you are, surprisingly. Number two, then the editing can be done by yourself afterward. That said, I had like nine editors on my book. Not all at the same time, but I had nine editors doing different chapters. Here's how you find an editor. Not how you find it. I'll talk about that. But here's what to look for in choosing an editor. Can anyone, Linda, thank you. Thank you, everyone who said me as well. So who, who in your life cares about you a lot, is smart, good with language, educated. Those can be different things, but you know, who's gonna be sharp? Who cares about you? Number two, who's sharp? And number three, who is willing to tell you when you're off, but also is genuinely enthusiastic about what you're doing? You don't want someone who's just shooting you down, and you don't want someone who is just buttering you up. Can we make that a quote? You don't want someone who's going to, you know, butter you up and you don't want someone who's going to just kind of make you feel bad about yourself. You kind of want both, right? You want, so obviously I'm, I'm thinking of Lindsay. She should be here today. Is she here today? We should bring her on video. She was my editor. Um, Emily, who's also here today, and many others have also edited my work. Maybe Emily could pop on if you remember anything specific about editing me. Um, that might be helpful. But basically, the way you find that person is you think of those qualities. Who's someone who's, um, you know, a close friend who would care, who is sharp, and who will have a combination of being kind, but also being comfortable, being critical. So basically, it's spaghetti on the face. It's the spaghetti on the face principle. If... Kate, Chelsea, uh, Deborah, if I am your friend and you have spaghetti on your face, what do I say? If I'm a true friend and you have spaghetti on your face, what do I say? Or you have toilet paper sticking to your shoe, what do I say? Emily. Hey there. All right, I'll wrap up this point and then you think really hard right now about everything you did editing wise. I'm not getting any replies on this one. So for anyone here, if I'm your friend and you have spaghetti on your face, what do I say? You have spaghetti on your face. Exactly. Sorry, there's a delay in the comments. So a true friend, I always say when someone points out that I have something in my teeth or whatever, um, when they point that out, I say, you're a true friend. I don't even care if I barely know them. I say, you're a true friend. Because a lot of people won't mention stuff. You can walk through a day in normal COVID, non-COVID times for hours with something embarrassing going on, something in your teeth, and no one points it out, right? So you want, so then the way you find that editor is you simply post on your Facebook, your Instagram, you just spread the word, your next door, whatever, and you just say, hey, I'm looking for someone who might be willing to edit. and pay them. 
pay them 10 bucks an hour, pay them 20 bucks an hour, pay them whatever you can pay them. Um, you don't need to look for a professional editor. That's my main advice. You need to look for someone who is a New Yorker subscriber, who is a nerd, who gets language, but cares about you because a professional editor, while they may be great, they may not care about you enough. All right, love that. Brutally honest from Shannon. Um, broccoli teeth, skirt backward, etc. So Emily, what when you edited, are you looking at a blank screen right now? Is I am, yeah. <laughs> you can just look off. Look, look at the Okay. She has a monitor, so it's always I you have to make eye contact with your who you're talking to. So in this case, <laughs> it's looking to the side. So Emily, what do you remember that might be helpful for people when you were editing my work? Like if you read something you hated, it was stupid, it was cringy, if you read something beautiful, if you read something that was confusing, what was helpful? What do you remember that might be helpful? Yeah, so I think it's, I'm glad that you said that it it doesn't have to be a professional editor because I think it's, at the time, I don't know that I felt like a professional editor and I didn't really come at it as a professional editor. I. Um, I didn't know you as well as Lindsay did. Lindsay's who Waylon just mentioned earlier. So I wasn't quite as comfortable either being like brutally honest, you might say. Um, but I read the book as a reader. So I went through the book and I just read it as if I were reading it normally. And that was a great way to be able to pick up, like point out where I was confused, point out the sections that I like love, the titles that I loved, the chapters I wanted to skim forward because I was bored. Um, so you don't even necessarily have to find somebody who has that like technical skill. Um, it's extremely helpful to get feedback as a writer that's more broad and say like, I was just really, you know, not, not engaged with this part of the book. Can you give me some more details here? And I think that's what I felt most comfortable doing for Waylon at the time. Um, and hopefully that was, that was still helpful. Super helpful. I always remember, I don't remember like, eight out of or uh, five out of the nine editors who edited my work. I remember you, I remember Sarah Krolik, I remember Lindsay, remember Bryony, I think. Um, but if you're at a point where you need a professional editor to move paragraphs from one chapter to the other and to restructure and to do all this stuff, then you didn't follow in my advice in this hour. You didn't prepare enough, you didn't make eye contact, you didn't serialize, you didn't live edit, which we talk about more in the course. Does that make sense? That should be a pull up. If you're at the point where you need major surgery, you need like a, uh, what do you call them? A contractor to, um, you know, dig up half of your property and move it to other parts of your property. And you're past the point where it's a genuine work. It still could be good. You can do intensive editing, but it's major surgery. Um, no, my book has not been translated. It's, I've had a few offers from it, readers to translate it, but I haven't taken them up on it because, frankly, I don't speak uh, other languages well enough to know if they did a good job or not. I just don't know how to do that. Um, Emily, anything else that you remember specifically? Like, so, you know, if you love something, highlighting something that you love, like saying, oh my God, this paragraph or this entire chapter or this sentence or this phrase, that's so helpful to know it connects. Mm -hmm. Even if it, yeah. Yeah, no, I was gonna say, I think too, the other thing I remember is when, so I am a nerd, so I did with more positive things. I had, Waylon and I, I think had a lot of fun going back and forth on, so Waylon really likes adjectives. If you've read the book, you will notice there are a ton of adjectives in the book and they're done in a really, really unique way in a way that, evoke something quite specific so Will and I had a lot of back and forth on like is this is this word the exact right word that you want to use in this string of adjectives um and that's kind of the fun too of doing it with somebody who you know and you know enjoys that type of dialogue so you can even when you're suggesting something different it can still be like a really fun conversation between two people where you're not just like red penning and crossing stuff out and making somebody feel terrible. <laughs> yeah, I love that example, Emily, because that gets to the title of this hour, which is editing the book the right way is trying to make it more specific, more detailed, 
more specific, less cliche. So basically, I kind of felt like we were cliche hunters. Like if we mm -hmm. ever saw love, the word love, because my book is about the Buddhist notion of love. If we ever saw the word love, we basically tried to get rid of it and to be more specific. What do you mean by love? What kind of love? You know, we all, there's that cliche of the Eskimos have a hundred words for snow or whatever it is. Human beings have hundreds of words for love. You know, there's obviously the four kinds of love in Greece, in Greek, whatever. I'm kind of out of my depth right now, but beyond that, there's so many, so many qualities and shades to that. Um, and then when you found something that you were, that you didn't like, not necessarily that you disliked, some, some that you disliked, but also some that you just were confused or bored, which mm -hmm. are often the same thing. Often when you're bored is because you don't really get it or it's too cliche, it's too vague. How did you, how did you look for that stuff? Um, I don't, I, I only remember, I think like one or two instances of that. There was one instance where I was just genuinely confused because Whalen's book specifically had a lot of like jumping back and forth between locations. So I remember being a little bit confused with some of that and saying like, okay, wait, I thought this was happening in this other place. Can you yeah. figure that out or like, you know, clarify that. And then, yeah, I mean, I think I just asked questions. So I would say, like this is how i read this is that what you mean um there was one part that i rem i don't even remember what it was but i remember Lindsay and i both being like "Ooh, that seems a little off but that can't be what you meant so like this is how we interpreted that is that what you meant to say because that's how it's coming across to us as the reader so um, what was the example do you remember i can't remember i want to say that it was something that came across as like hypersexual and wasn't supposed to be but in the context of it like you could tell from the rest of the chapter that that it felt a bit out of place but it was just i think another instance of you being like very um specific and descriptive in your language and it just like read a bit differently than it probably came out in your head um yeah i do remember one instance that actually got edited in the second edition the current edition that you get if you buy it now because vanessa was reading through the entire thing with me because we recorded the uh, audiobook together when there was this instance where i was talking about i don't remember dating or something and she felt like i was kind of talking about women as objects mm -hmm. and i was like kind of offended like we kind of got into a big not really but like sort of i was kind of offended i was like no i'm talking about I don't know. I don't remember the exact instance, but I wasn't coming from that point of view. But what was being heard or interpreted from her experience was a bit objectifying. And ultimately, because we're good friends and colleagues, over time, I softened and I was like, well, objectively, if someone from their experience is hearing that, then I still need to address it, whether or not I intended it. It's very similar to anti-racism education, whether or not you intend something to be, to land a certain way. Um, if it does land a certain way, you're never gonna please everyone, but you can still make it more specific. So that's what I did, I edited it. Um, let's go through one or two more questions. Um, should we know peeps definitely want to read our books before writing it? Uh, hell no. If you care about, and Emily at this point, since you're here, jump in on anything. Um, no, you need to care about what you're writing. That's all you need to begin. And then serializing it, you'll find a way, the eye contact notion of connecting it with others. Um, you need to deeply obsessively, not obsessively in a neurotic way, but obsessively in a, in a way like if you're a good cook, you, every detail of what you're baking or cooking matters to you. You need to deeply care about what you're writing. That's the only thing, because if you don't have that, you're never gonna get through the arduous, confusing, you know, blindfolded hallway that is writing a book. Um, yeah, and I would say, I think that might be a good spot to point out too, that, that that's part of the difference between publishing your book independently versus publishing kind of the mainstream publisher way, because I do know that they, they think a lot about like, do you have a following? Do you have, you know, all this stuff that would likely influence the direction that you take on your book? And what Wayland teaches in the book course is in my thought process like it's a much more genuine way of 
you're going to write about what you want to write about and we can help make that connect versus trying to write about what you think people want to hear about. Yeah, there's a question about is it acceptable to write in British English versus American English versus whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, you should write in the dialect or the uh, language that you're most comfortable writing for, and it can always be translated. But, um, you know, between you and me, uh, most Americans view British English as more beautiful, if anything. Um, we're all jealous. Like, Emily lives in Scotland. Scotland is not British English, but. Um, you know, it's much more romantic, the Scottish, Irish, uh, British, English, um, even Australian, which can be a little grating sometimes, sorry to be offensive. Um, it's much more fun than American English is very John Wayne. Well, here's my book. All right. Um, let's jump through into a couple more. Emily, do you see any that you love? Uh, how much do you think you should write every day, hours or pages? Um, I don't like that kind of question i don't like that kind of pressure but i do think you should write every day um you should sit down and write something every day but don't don't put too much pressure on yourself because pressure that's where i mentioned the depression thing um pressure is like this weird willpower like has anyone ever tried to diet to lose weight you're putting pressure on yourself and then before you know it, you're eating two pints of ice cream so you know that's sort of like writer's block you something in yourself wants to go the opposite direction. Emily, do you, are you looking to ask a question? I am, yes. Any that you love, do you wanna talk about yours? I feel like we kind of addressed it. Yeah, I mean, I guess, do you have any tips for like how to sort of, how did you soften when initially you were like defensive of Vanessa or offended by the notion that your book would come across that way? Like, do you have any tips for just sort of softening up and being open to that feedback versus feeling bad yeah. or defensive about it? I mean, again, the main thing is to pick an editor who cares about you and is willing to point out the spaghetti on your face because then you're more receptive. Like if I criticize Emily, I'm pretty sure you would be really open to it because you know who I am and you know I care about you and you know I respect you. But if it's some stranger on an Instagram comment saying blah, 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 that can be more hurtful, ironically, even though you don't know them or care about them at all because they're not coming from a a caring place. Um, so criticism has to be caring. Criticism is a, a craft, is, is an art. Um, typically, I wasn't hurt with the millions of edits. I was in a really good place. I think even as initially approached it saying, this is sexist, you're being objectifying. And that was very hurtful because I certainly don't want to be a person like that. And that wasn't my intention. But ultimately, I was able because I respected her. I was able to kind of digest it and say, well, even if it's landing that way, I mean, what I already said, then it's my response is my opportunity, not just responsibility mm -hmm. to help it land because I care about it. You know? Yeah. Let's do one more question. I know we're over time. Um, um, maybe Meg asked about writing um, young adult novels and children's books. So maybe do you want to talk for a minute about like who the book course is for and who it can help? Yeah, I mean, the book course is sort of generically for anybody writing, it's, is, is deliberately intended for someone putting together a collection of poetry or a, a, you know, a novel or a children's book or a, a biography is deliberately, uh, you know, aimed at any kind of work because the process is very similar and the marketing is very similar and the printing and the selling is very similar the community is very similar. Um, so I really try to focus on all the kind of the truths for the craft and the marketing and the, the selling and all that. Um, so I think it would be helpful for anyone. It's quite affordable too, so it's not a huge risk. And, and at worst, I would think eight out of the 10, you know, lessons or whatever in it would be helpful. And, you know, if something doesn't land is kind of like, you know, reading a great, writer's book some of it's not going to land but hopefully if even one thing really does that could be invaluable or worthwhile um so yeah i encourage everyone we put a ton we put way too much love into the book course um hopefully it's helpful hopefully it's fun thank you all for coming i'm doing two more uh lectures what are the next two emily 
Um, we'll do a little bit more about serialization, but serialization as a way to sell the book and then printing and publishing. And serialization to me is the silver bullet. It's the, it's the whole key. Um, and then yeah, printing and publishing. Most books are plastic, coated, toxic, never um, throw awayable or recyclable. Um, how do you sell the hell out of a book? Because most authors are kind of broke, even successful authors are pretty broke. Um, that doesn't have to be the case. How can you avoid Amazon? How can you do it uh, ethically? Um, so thank you, everyone. Please give a heart or uh, something if it was helpful. Uh, let's all take a good posture. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Linda. All right. So Hi, um, yeah, please don't hang up on me, but Emily, thank you for coming on. Um, sorry about the light. You probably couldn't see much of me for the last 20 minutes, but uh, yeah, the book course is there. It's 10% off only right now. Um, if you want to jump in 10% off, isn't that much, but it's like 30 bucks. Uh, enough to buy like a avocado toast in in LA, uh, so that's that's you know a fair amount. And nothing's in the attic. We're renovating it because it goes out to my balcony. But uh, hopefully, eventually, the attic will. I want to put like a meditation space in there. A guest futon is actually already up there, and uh, a rowing machine made in the U.S. Uh, I think those are the three things I want up there. Maybe a little book nook. All right, Linda signed up. Thank you so much. Please do subscribe. Please do write elephantjournal.com slash post. Um, and I hope this was fun. Crystal, awesome. Great to hear. Erica, Lucia, thank you all for coming. Thanks for taking an hour out of your day. Uh, no, the book course, Salim, I just talked about it, but it's for any kind of book. So it doesn't get super specific about one kind of the other, but it is um, aimed at everything. Yeah, serialization is the key to selling and creating a community. Best hour today, Andrea, that's so sweet. Paige, thank you, Paige. Hope you had a good time. Mazesh, thank you. Jenny, glad that you're inspired. And remember, writing should be helpful to others. We're not just writing for ourselves. All right, folks.